Question 1. Which two cities are referred in Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities? 1. Paris and Venice. 2. Venice and Florence. 3. London and Paris. 4. London and Birmingham. And the answer is 3. London and Paris. Now let's focus on the explanations. First off, remember we're juggling between London and Paris in Dickens' masterpiece, not taking a tour of Italy or hopping around England. This isn't just about the cities. It's about the whole chaotic vibe of the French Revolution era. Keep these cities in mind because UGC Net loves to check if you're paying attention to details like these. Dickens isn't just giving us a history lesson. He's all about the drama, the emotions, and, oh boy, the sacrifices. Think Sidney Carton, big hero vibes by giving up everything for his friends. It's this mix of personal drama and historical chaos that Dickens nails perfectly. This theme of sacrifice, gold for understanding the emotional depth in literature. Dickens's work is a staple, not just in literature, but in understanding how personal and political worlds collide. UGCNet digs this because it shows you can grasp complex themes and see beyond the surface of the story. Plus, Dickens's critique of politics and society, always relevant. If you've noticed, UGCNet has a soft spot for questions about settings, themes, and character dynamics in classic literature. It's their way of saying, do you really get what these books are about? So, Dickens and his two cities? Bet on seeing them or something similar when you sit for that exam. Ace the exam tip. To nail questions about a tale of two cities or any literature, picture the setting and the main characters in your mind. Imagine Sidney Carton's journey, the tension between London and Paris, and the sheer emotional roller coaster. Making it visual helps the details stick, so when Dickens pops up on your exam, you're ready to roll. Edgar Allan Poe is often called the originator of the short story as an established genre. He defined the prose tale as, the options are, one, a narrative which can be read at one sitting of, from half an hour to two hours. Two, a narrative which can be read within five minutes or less. Three, a narrative that can be read at one sitting of from one hour to four hours. Four, a narrative that may be concluded and enjoyed in the single spell of less than half an hour. And the answer is one, a narrative which can be read at one sitting of from half an hour to two hours. Now it's time for the explanations. So we're chatting about Poe and how he pretty much set the stage for the short story as we know it. He's like the architect behind the blueprint of every gripping can't put it down tale you've loved. And here's the kicker. He believed a good story is one you can knock out in one sitting anywhere from half an hour to two hours. That's our gold standard for a solid read. Poe wasn't just about making stuff up on the fly. He had a formula, a recipe for writing that he swore by. It's like he was cooking up stories with the precision of a chef. The key ingredients, keep it short, make it punchy, and everything, from the creepy settings to the last word, should leave you feeling some type of way. And yes, he had a thing for the theme of a beautiful woman's death. Dark, I know, but it was his go-to for maximum emotional impact. Unity of effect, Poe's all about that single, powerful vibe a story gives off. It's like watching a movie where every scene, every line, is pushing you towards that one big emotional explosion. Length matters. In a world of TLDR, Poe's insistence on brevity in storytelling is a reminder of why sometimes less is more. Um, it's not just about keeping your reader's attention, it's about mastering the art of saying a lot with a little. The philosophy of composition. This isn't just Poe showing off. It's him giving us the cheat codes to great writing. Pay attention here, and you're getting insights from one of the masters. Why do these themes keep popping up in UGC net exams? Because understanding Poe's approach gives you a deep dive into the mechanics of story storytelling and literary analysis. It's not just about knowing the stories. It's about understanding how and why they work. Plus, it's a heads up that a grasp on literature's classics and their creators is crucial. Quickly, those other answers about the story length, too short or too long, don't fit Poe's sweet spot. He was specific about the time frame for a reason, to keep you engaged and wrap it up before you start zoning out or needing a break. It's all about that perfect balance. All right, how do you keep this from becoming just another set of forgotten facts by tomorrow? Connect Poe's principles to stories or movies you love. Think about how they grab your attention, how they play with your emotions, and how they wrap up just when they should. 
See if you can spot the unity of effect in your favorites. The essay, Discourse in the Novel, discusses that the novel is constituted by a multiplicity of divergent and contending social voices. Who is the author of this essay? Here are the options. 1. E.M. Forster, 2. Mikhail Bakhtin, 3. Dostoevsky, 4. Edgar Allan Poe. And here is the answer. 2. Mikhail Bakhtin. Let's talk about it in details that you won't forget. We're talking about Mikhail Bakhtin, a big deal in the literary world, especially when you're diving into the depths of the UGC net exam. His masterpiece, The Dialogic Imagination, is something you definitely want to cozy up with if you're aiming to crack those literary theory questions they love to throw at you. Picture this. Bakhtin chilling in the 20th century, thinking deep thoughts about novels and how they're like the ultimate mixtape of voices and perspectives. This dude basically argues that novels aren't just stories. They're conversations. Not just between characters, but between different points of view, historical moments, and even genres. It's like every novel is a party, and everyone's invited. Dialogue is king. For Bakhtin, and for anyone hitting the books for the UGC net, understanding that the novel thrives on dialogue is key. It's not about one voice ruling them all. It's about how these voices clash, mix, and mingle to paint a picture of life that's rich and multifaceted. This concept is huge because it flips the script on how we traditionally think about storytelling. Breaking it down, those essays, like Epic and Novel or Discourse in the Novel, are Bakhtin's way of showing us the evolution of narrative sauce. He takes you from the days when stories were about heroes and legends to the novel's world, where it's all about representing reality in its messy glory. For your UGC net prep, these insights are gold. They show you how to look beyond the plot and get into the novel's nuts and bolts. Heteroglossia. Sounds fancy, right? It's just Bakhtin's way of saying that novels juggle of different voices, views, and values. Every word in a novel is pulling double duty, not just moving the story along, but also packing a punch with perspective and ideology. When you're dissecting texts for the UGC net, keep this in the back of your mind. It'll help you unlock layers you didn't even know were there. Why obsess over Bakhtin for the UGC net? Because the exam is all about peeling back the layers of literature, understanding its forms, and getting why it matters. Bakhtin's work is like a masterclass in this. It's not just about knowing the books and who wrote what. It's about grasping how literature reflects, challenges, and plays with the world around it. Question 4. Which among the following is not a character from Jane Austen's novel, Persuasion? 1. Sir Walter Elliot. 2. Lady Russell. 3. Miss Crawford. 4. Frederick Wentworth. Answer. 3. Miss Crawford. Explanations. Sir Walter Elliot from Persuasion. Picture this guy as the king of Vanity Fair. He's all about that high society life, obsessed with looking good and hanging out with the elite. He's not a fan of sailors because, in his eyes, their sun-kissed skin just doesn't match the refined look he goes for. Sir Walter's like that meme-worthy narcissist who can't stop admiring himself in the mirror. For your UGC net, remember, he's the epitome of self-obsession and a prime example of the shallow aristocracy Jane Austen loved to poke fun at. Captain Frederick Wentworth, also from Persuasion, is the poster boy for the self-made man. He's got that dreamy, hard-working vibe going on, making his fortune through sheer determination rather than just inheriting it. He's Austin's nod to the changing tide of the 19th century gentry. Work hard, play hard, and maybe sail the high seas. Important for your exam, Wentworth represents the emergence of a new kind of gentleman, one built on merit rather than birthright. Lady Russell, yet another persuasion star, plays the role of Anne Elliot's fairy godmother, minus the magic wand. She's super close to Anne, advising her like a mother figure would, and was a major reason Anne didn't marry Wentworth initially. Lady Russell values social ladder climbing and sees Anne as the daughter most like her own bestie. For your exam, grasp that Lady Russell's character highlights the weight of societal approval and influence in decisions of the heart. Miss Crawford from Mansfield Park is your quintessential charming, witty lady who knows how to make an entrance and leave people wanting more. She's all about that high society life, but brings a dash of controversy and fun to the mix, especially with her playful jabs at the Navy. 
important for UGC Net, Miss Crawford embodies the allure and complexity of Austin's characters, showing how charm and flirtation can both fascinate and unsettle the moral compass of those around her. Mrs. Norris from Mansfield Park. If Austin's novels had a villain hall of fame, Mrs. Norris would have her portrait hanging there. She's the ant from hell, making Fanny Price's life miserable while hoarding money like it's going out of style. Think of her as that relative you avoid at family gatherings. She's a lesson in how not to adult, pushing for unhappy marriages and cutting corners at others' expense. George Knightley in Emma is basically the guy everyone loves but doesn't know it yet. He's kind, considerate, and sees through all the nonsense. His love for Emma is as real as it gets, without any of the fluff or drama. Important, Knightley stands out as the gold standard for what Austin considers the ideal man. Genuine, caring, and with a no BS attitude towards life and love. Elizabeth Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. Lizzie is the OG feminist, not here for anyone's nonsense, especially not Mr. Darcy's, well, not at first anyway. She's smart, she's witty, and she calls it like she sees it, which makes her the perfect match for someone who can appreciate a woman who doesn't mince words. For your exam, Lizzie is a masterclass in character development and challenging societal norms. Fitzwilliam Darcy, also from Pride and Prejudice, starts off as Mr. Tall, Dark, and Not So Friendly, but ends up being Mr. Right. He's all about that personal growth, learning to get over himself and go all in for love. His evolution from a proud snob to a swoon-worthy hero is something to keep in mind for the exam. It's a great example of character development and romantic ideals. Eleanor Dashwood, from Sense and Sensibility, is like that friend who keeps everything together while quietly dealing with her own drama. She's sensible, caring, and way more patient than most of us could be. Her story makes you wonder about the emotional cost of always being the strong one. Important, Eleanor represents the internal struggle between personal desire and social responsibility. Diana Parker in Sanditon gives us a glimpse of what could have been with her quirky, health-obsessed antics. She's all about those alternative remedies and makes you wish Austin had gotten to finish this tale. Diana's character hints at Austin's interest in exploring more unconventional personalities. Question 5. Prose romances preceded the emergence of novel as a popular literary genre. Which texts among the following fall under the category of prose romance? 1. The Pilgrim's Progress and the Spectator, Oronoko and the Fair Jilt, 3. Pamela and Clarissa, 4. Amelia and Ferdinand Count Fathom. Answer 2. Oronoko and the Fair Jilt, Explanations. So Oronoko and the Fair Jilt are your go-to examples when you're talking about prose romance, a kind of storytelling that was cool and popular before the novel became the big boss of English literature. Think of them as the early birds in the English lit scene. Oronoko by Afra Bain, which hit the shelves in 1688, is this epic tale that mixes adventure, romance, and some deep thoughts about morality and the early fight against slavery. Um, Bain was kind of ahead of her time, drawing from her own travels to Suriname. The story centers on Oronoko, an African prince who ends up enslaved. It's heavy on criticizing the hypocrisy of civilized folks and digs into the dark sides of slavery. Super important because it's like a preview of novel writing with its mix of storytelling and social commentary. The Fair Jilt is another of Bain's creations, also from 1688, and it's all about the wild roller coaster of love, passion, and the crazy stuff people do for it. Through Miranda, the main character, Ben dives into the mess and drama of love gone wrong. It's a mix of juicy gossip and a critical look at society's norms, showing the power of storytelling before novels took over. These two are perfect examples for the UGC Net exam because they show how prose romance was doing its thing before novels became the norm. They're like the precursors to the novel genre, mixing personal drama with broader societal issues. Now about the others, The Pilgrim's Progress, an esteemed religious allegory penned by the English author John Bunyan, was disseminated in two distinct segments in the years 1678 and 1684, respectively. The Spectator, 1711 to 1712, published daily in London by Steele and Addison, aimed to blend morality with wit and vice versa, introducing a spectator club to present various viewpoints. 
Pamela and Clarissa by Samuel Richardson and works like Amelia and Ferdinand, Count Fathom lean more towards what we think of as novels, focusing on individual experiences and moral lessons through a more realistic lens. Question number six, what is An Introduction by Kamala Das? One, a short story on the theme of people's rights and freedom. Two, an introduction to her autobiography, My Story. Three, a poem of resistance and protest. Four, an essay on the theme of gender rights. Answer, three, a poem of resistance and protest. Here's the explanations. A Kamala Saraya, who you might also know as Madhavi Kudi, or by her married name, Kamala Das, was a powerhouse in Indian literature. Born on March 31, 1934 in Kerala, India, and passing away on May 31, 2009, she left a huge mark with her works in both English and Malayalam. She's pretty famous in Kerala for her short stories and the super honest autobiography, My Story, which you, which you definitely need to know for UGC Net English, by the way. Her English works are loved for their poetic style and another autobiographical narrative. Plus, she wrote some really engaging columns on everything from women's issues and childcare to politics. She was totally ahead of her time, openly exploring female sexuality and breaking tons of cultural taboos. My Story, originally published in Malayalam as Ente Katha, is kind of a big deal. It's the best-selling autobiography by a woman in India. It dives into Das's marital struggles and her path to finding herself as both a woman and a writer. Though it's called an autobiography, Das later spilled the beans that she mixed in some fictional bits too. Then there's the poem An Introduction from her first poetry collection, Summer in Calcutta, which came out in 1965. This piece is super important for UGC Net English. It's all about her dealing with a male-dominated society, showcasing her knack for politics and language and the rough patches in her marriage while searching for true love. Even though she wasn't a hardcore political junkie, she had a solid grip on India's political scene, which has been pretty much a boys club from Nehru on. Das wasn't shy about sharing her life story, from her roots in Malabar to being fluent in three languages. She stood her ground about writing in English, even when people criticized it as a holdover from colonial times. She really hit on the major issues women face, especially the unrealistic expectations dumped on them in marriage and their quest for real love instead of just catering to male desires. In her marriage, Das talks about how jarring it was to jump from childhood straight into a role of womanhood she didn't recognize. Her poem paints a vivid picture of the gap between a woman's need for genuine affection and a husband just looking out for himself. She even encounters a dude who embodies the typical male ego, driving home her point that both sexes are equal when it comes to sin and virtue, love and betrayal. Kamala Das's work goes way beyond just personal stories. She opens a window into the struggles women face with societal norms and personal identity under the heavy weight of patriarchal expectations. Her legacy is all about the power of speaking out and the ongoing fight for gender equality. Question number seven, which text is considered a short treatise on transcendentalism by the Transcendental Club? One, Emerson's Nature. Two, Thoreau's Walden. Three, Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Four, Thoreau's Civil Disobedience. Answer, one, Emerson's Nature. Here's the explanations. Back in the early to mid-19th century, a bunch of cool writers, philosophers, reformers, and brainy folks in New England got together and kicked off what we now know as Transcendentalism. They called themselves the Transcendental Club. On September 8, 1836, some key players like Frederick Henry Hedge, Ralph Waldo Emerson, George Ripley, and George Putnam met up in Cambridge, Massachusetts to chat about starting this new club. They had their first official hangout at Ripley's place in Boston. This gang grew to include other big names like Amos Bronson Alcott, Theodore Parker, Henry David Thoreau, and even some pioneering women like Sophia Ripley and Margaret Fuller. Funny thing though, they never actually called themselves the Transcendental Club. That name was something the public and critics threw at them after an 1837 review of Emerson's work, Nature. Super important for UGC Net English, by the way. James Eliot Cabot later said that these guys were just a group of forward-thinking buddies, all, all about being open-minded. In July 1840, they started The Dial magazine, which Emerson bigged up as the voice of a new era. 
And speaking of Emerson, his nature is pretty much the Bible of transcendentalism, capturing all the big ideas they were all about. Back in the mid-19th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a deep thinker and philosopher, hit the streets of Boston and the calm American countryside on a quest to find himself and make sense of the world. His big aha moment came during a visit to the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris. This insight was about to shake up American literature and philosophy big time. Buzzing with fresh ideas and a love for the great outdoors, Emerson got cracking on what would turn into his crowning achievement, nature. Published in 1836, this wasn't just any old essay. It was a full-on declaration that the usual way of thinking was out and transcendentalism was in. Nature is super important for UGC Net English, by the way, because it's like the manifesto for the whole transcendentalism movement. As he wrote Nature, Emerson pictured a world where people and nature were in sync, where every little thing in nature, from leaves to rocks, was infused with something divine, shedding light on the mysteries of existence. He broke down nature into four uses, commodity, beauty, language, and discipline. These represented the different ways we connect with nature, from the everyday stuff to the deeply spiritual. Emerson's words were like a wake-up call. He was all about encouraging folks to ditch the distractions of daily life and find peace and inspiration in the quiet of the wild. He famously said, to go into solitude, a man needs to retire as much from his chamber as from society. He was stressing the importance of stepping away from life's hustle to truly tune into what the universe has to offer. The essay has eight carefully crafted parts, nature, commodity, beauty, language, discipline, idealism, spirit, and prospects. Each section is a mix of deep philosophical thought and a poetic ode to the natural world. Emerson argued that to really get nature, you need to cut ties with society's mess and dive into both the outer wilderness and your inner self. For Emerson, nature was this big spiritual deal. It was about more than just trees and rocks. It was a living breathing it was constantly giving and shaping our experiences. He saw nature as this ongoing process that's always working for our benefit, from winds spreading seeds to nature's cycles feeding us. Nature wasn't just an essay. It was a life changer, a guidebook for those looking to figure out where they fit in the universe, and a light for anyone wanting to connect more with both the world around them and the deeper spiritual stuff. Emerson's masterpiece laid down the groundwork for transcendentalism and inspired loads of thinkers, writers, and truth seekers to look to nature as the ultimate key to unlocking life's big mysteries and appreciating its beauty. Walt Whitman first dropped Leaves of Grass back in 1855, and yeah, he published it himself because he was all about that DIY spirit. Over his lifetime, he kept tweaking and expanding this book rolling out a total of nine different editions. When it first came out, people had mixed feelings about it. Some thought it was super innovative, while others weren't fans of its explicit vibes or how it strayed from traditional poetry styles. Ralph Waldo Emerson, a big name in poetry, was totally into it, though. He even told Whitman, I greet you at the beginning of a great career, which is a huge deal to remember for the UGC Net English exam. The thing about Leaves of Grass is that it's known for kicking traditional verse to the curb and celebrating stuff like democracy, love, sexuality, death, and just the overall epic nature of the human spirit. Song of Myself is probably the most famous poem in there. It's all about celebrating both the individual and everyone else at the same time. Despite its deep themes, the book's open talk about sexuality got it banned in a bunch of places. Right before the Civil War kicked off, the 1860 edition came out, and it had poems that mirrored the heavy divisions in the nation at that time. Post-war, Whitman added drum taps, reflecting his time nursing soldiers and thinking over the war's impacts. After President Lincoln was assassinated, he penned When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed as a sort of tribute. The last version Whitman put out there, the Deathbed Edition, hit shelves in 1892, the same year he passed away. Leaves of Grass isn't just another poetry collection, it's a major player in American literature, influencing a whole bunch of poets and writers after Whitman. Funding was always tight, and the book's racy content didn't help. Whitman found it tough to land a publisher for his later editions, so he kept on self-publishing. 
This backstory adds to the grit and perseverance wrapped up in its legacy. Question number eight. What does Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks primarily deal with? One, pain of a prisoner during colonial times. Two, recollections of love, romance, and blissful life. Three, philosophy, culture, literature, and the role of intellectuals. Four, exploitation of blacks during the colonial times. Answer. Three, philosophy, culture, literature, and the role of intellectuals. Here's the explanations. Antonio Gramsci, a major Italian Marxist thinker, managed to write his famous prison notebooks, or Quaderni del Carcere, while he was locked up by the fascist government from 1929 to 1935, after being nabbed in 1926. Big shout out to his buddy, Piero Sraffa, who slipped him the writing tools he needed. Despite being in jail, Gramsci churned out over 30 notebooks, roughly 3,000 pages loaded with, with deep historical insights and analysis. Um, his work wasn't set up in the usual bookish way, but it's still hailed for tossing fresh ideas into the political theory mix during the 20th century. Gramsci wasn't just about Marx. He pulled ideas from a bunch of thinkers, both Marxist and non-Marxist, like Niccolò Machiavelli, Giorgio Sorel, and Benedetto Croce. He dived into topics like Italian history, fascism, cultural vibes, and how power and consent play out in society. His theories ended up being super important for Western Marxist ideology, particularly influencing communist tactics in the West after World War II. His takes on hegemony, specifically about Southern Italy, the Italian Communist Party, and even the Roman Catholic Church were particularly eye-opening. Also, his Letters from Prison, or Lettere del Carcere, got put together and published posthumously in 1947, adding more layers to his legacy. Now, diving into some big ideas linked to Gramsci that are totally key for UGC Net English. Cultural hegemony is all about how capitalism keeps its grip through cultural norms and values. It's like the air we breathe, so woven into life that you almost don't notice it. He was all for educating workers to help grow a class of working class intellectuals. Um, he split up the rough and tough political society from the more brainy, ideology driven civil society. Gramsci was big on absolute historicism, pushing for analyses tailored to specific contexts. He wasn't about economic determinism being the end all. He saw Marxism as not fatalistic, meaning we're not just stuck with what we're handed. And he critiqued philosophical materialism, arguing that we've got to consider ideologies too. Gramsci's work is pretty foundational if you're trying to get a handle on Marxist theory, critical theory, and educational theory. Uh, he brings a fresh lens to looking at power, culture, and, and history that's still super relevant today. Question number nine, who coined the term panopticism? One, Antonio Gramsci. Two, Michel Foucault. Three, Slavoj Zizek for a role and answer. Two, Foucault. Here's the explanations. All right, let's dive into some of Foucault's cool ideas. The panopticon. Back in the mid 1970s, Foucault got into the panopticon concept, thanks to his book, Discipline and Punish from 1975. He used the panopticon, originally a prison design, as a metaphor to talk about how societies have controlled people's behavior from the 18th century onwards, aiming to keep everyone orderly and useful. Uh, Foucault thought of the panopticon not just as a clever building design, but as a whole vibe, showing how power works and how it could be a model for managing societies. This concept is a big deal for UGC Net English because it shows how deeply, deeply architecture and society can reflect power dynamics. Social construction of madness. Foucault was fascinated by how society differentiates madness from mental illness, seeing madness more as a social thing than just a medical issue. He looked at this through different historical periods like the Renaissance and the 17th and 18th centuries, all the way to modern times. Power and knowledge. One of Foucault's key themes is how power and knowledge feed off each other. He argued that the way we set up our institutions and what we think we know can reinforce the power structures in society. Evolution of medical practices. In his book, The Birth of the Clinic, Foucault took a hard look at how medicine changed around the late 18th and early 19th centuries, especially focusing on how doctors started to observe patients differently. Archaeology of knowledge. Through books like The Order of Things, Foucault got into how each historical period has its own rules that define what counts as true or scientifically legit. 
discourse analysis. Um, Foucault was all about analyzing how our language and day-to-day -day practices within certain historical settings shape what we understand as truth, knowledge, and power. Critique of psychiatry. Early in his career, Foucault was critical of psychiatry, influencing what came to be known as the anti-psychiatry movement. He argued that a lot of psychiatric practices were more about societal control than about healthcare. Influence of literature. Foucault also believed literature was powerful, particularly enjoying writers like Raymond Roussel, because he thought literature could uncover hidden layers of society and our inner selves. Epistemological foundations. In works like The Logic of Sense, Foucault challenged the usual ways we think about knowledge, focusing on how language and paradoxes shape our understanding. Methodical writing. Unlike just throwing ideas on paper, Foucault was all about a careful and analytical approach to writing. This was evident in how he described putting together his book, Madness and Civilization. Each of these ideas helps us see how Foucault viewed the connections between power, society, and how we think about knowledge and behavior. For anyone diving into UGC Net English, understanding Foucault's perspectives can really open up ways of seeing literature and society differently. Roland Barthes was a major player in the semiotics game, which is all about the science of signs and symbols. According to him, signs can be anything that conveys a meaning, like traffic lights, words, or even how you dress and the music you listen to. These signs get their meanings from the situations they're in. For example, a hat isn't just a hat. Sure, it's headwear. That's the straightforward denotative meaning. But in the right context, like on a policeman, it screams authority. That's the deeper connotative meaning. Barthes really got into structuralism, especially when talking about literature, as seen in works like Mythologies and the Fashion System. He was all about seeing things as part of a big system of meanings. In literature, he dug into the different layers of language in a text, like functions, actions, and the storyline, and how they all work together to give a piece its vibe. In his famous essay, The Death of the Author, 1967, which is super important for UGC Net English, Barth shook up the old school idea that a book's meaning is all about what the author meant to say. He argued that because language is so fluid, pinning down one true meaning is kind of a myth. In Writing Degree Zero, Barth splits his thoughts into two parts, starting with a set of essays that separate the idea of writing from style or language. He also came up with the terms readerly and writerly to talk about different types of literature and how people approach reading them. He really goes deep into these ideas in his book SZ and the essay From Work to Text from Image Music Text, 1977. These works look at how readers interact with texts in either passive or active ways, kind of critiquing our modern reading habits. In und, and expanding on this in SZ, 1975, Barthes introduced the idea of readerly reading, emphasizing that a text's meaning comes alive through how the reader interprets it, leading to many possible meanings. He outlined five semantic codes, hermeneutic, proeretic, semantic, symbolic, and referential, to help analyze and understand texts, really pushing the idea that readers play an active role in creating meaning. Over his career, Barthes wrote a ton, majorly influencing semiotics, literary theory, and structuralism. Some of his key works include Writing Degree Zero, 1968, Elements of Semiology, 1968, Mythologies, 1972, The Pleasure of the Text, 1975, and Essay, 1975, Image, Music, Text, 1977, Camera Lucida, Reflections on Photography, 1981. Each of these dives into his thoughts on how we create, share, and interpret meanings in various ways, making his work a treasure trove for anyone getting into the nuances of tough text and meaning, especially if you're prepping for something like the UGC Net English exam. Gramsci really shook things up with his idea of cultural hegemony. He explained how the big bosses, the bourgeoisie, keep their power in capitalist societies not just by throwing their weight around with money or muscle, but through culture, things like schools, media, and art. Instead of just pushing people around economically, they spread ideas that make their top dog status seem normal. Gramsci wasn't all about the economic side like traditional Marxists. He added a twist, making Marxism more about real-life practices and thinking about history, 
in a way that goes deeper than just money or ideas alone. This got him tagged as a neo-Marxist because he was kind of a fresh voice in the Marxist scene. Then there's Slavoj Žižek, born in 1949, a philosopher from Slovenia who's big on mixing psychoanalysis, politics, and culture. Um, he's known for stirring the pot with his bold takes and a sense of humor that's made him a star a thinker on the Western left from the late 20th century into the new millennium. Žižek first made waves with his early work, Le Plus Sublime de Historique Hegel Pass, 1988, which dives into German idealism and was basically him putting his name out there in the philosophy world. His first hit in English, The Sublime Object of Ideology, 1989, is crucial for UGC net English folks. It's where he lays down his major ideas. Ernesto Leclo, another big thinker, even did the intro and talked up Zizek's style of jumping around in time, which fits with Lacanian psychoanalysis's idea that what happens later can mess with how we see what went before. This book gets deep into Lacan's idea of the objet petit a, that tricky thing everyone wants but can't quite get. Zizek argues that the whole notion of stepping outside or beyond our deep-seated beliefs to find happiness or make choices is just a fantasy, an ideological trap. This kind of bold critique of our belief systems and the exploration of deep theoretical and political ideas is what Zizek's known for and keeps coming back to in his later work. Question number 10. Which writer remarked, I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor? 1. Henry David Thoreau. 2. Ralph Waldo Emerson. 3. Henry James. 4. Emily Dickinson. Answer 1. Henry David Thoreau. Here's the explanations. Walden, by Henry David Thoreau, is basically his detailed account of ditching society for two years to live in a small cabin in the woods, starting on July 4th, 1845. Thoreau was on a mission to strip life down to the bare essentials, build a cabin near Concord, Massachusetts, and soak up everything nature had to offer, like gardening, watching wildlife, and just thinking about life. He was all about keeping things simple, and questioned why everyone was so caught up in working their tails off for stuff they didn't really need. Thoreau thought people were missing out on the beauty of nature and the growth of their spirits, believing he was richer living freely and simply than anyone wrapped up in material gains. During a time when slavery was a dark part of American reality, Thoreau didn't just condemn the obvious evils of slavery, but also criticized how society was enslaved to materialism and conformism. He saw living close to Concord not just as a physical location, but as a metaphorical step away from the shackles of society. Thoreau was tight with Ralph Waldo Emerson's ideas, and Walden really pushes the American individualism vibe, slamming the materialistic and conformist ways of society. The book is a classic in personal development, loaded with timeless advice like, If one advances confidently in the direction of his own dreams, and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. This quote is golden, especially for UGC Net English, as it encourages following your own path to find unexpected success. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. Another gem that speaks to improving yourself through deliberate actions. Here's the lowdown on Walden and what Thoreau was all about. Simplicity and minimalism. Thoreau is all for living simply to focus on what's truly important, cutting out society's excess. Nature and solitude. He digs deep into nature and values the insights that come with being alone. Self-reliance. Big on doing things on your own, both in terms of material needs and spiritual growth. Critique of materialism. He's not shy about calling out society's materialistic chase as a distraction from what's meaningful. Reflection and personal growth. Thoreau used his time at Walden Pond to think deeply about his life, leading to personal insights and growth. Social criticism and civil disobedience. He shares his thoughts on social justice, including strong critiques of slavery and governance issues. Connection to transcendentalism. Thoreau's work screams transcendentalism, believing in the goodness of people and nature. Economic independence. He explores the idea that you can live well with very little money if you choose a simple life. Observation of nature. 
Thoreau offers detailed observations of the environment, seasons, and wildlife to better understand the world and our place in it. The book is filled with philosophical thoughts based on his own life experiences and what he sees around him. Thoreau's Walden uh, is more than just a book about living in the woods. It's about challenging the status quo and finding a deeper connection to life itself. Henry David Thoreau's Civil Disobedience, originally called Resistance to Civil Government when it hit the shelves in 1849, is all about why it's sometimes okay, even necessary, to break the rules if the rules are crummy. Here's the lowdown. Personal integrity over government law. Thoreau's big on following your own moral compass over the law if those laws are bad news. He's pretty adamant that if something feels wrong, you shouldn't just go along with it because it's a law. Critique of a materialistic society. Thoreau isn't a fan of how American society is all about money and getting more stuff instead of focusing on what's right and moral. He thinks people should value justice and principles more than their bank accounts. Nonviolent resistance. He's all about peaceful protest. Thoreau's ideas here would later inspire big names like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Ineffectiveness of the democratic process. He's not too hot on democracy when it comes to moral issues, uh, uh, especially if most people are okay with things that are just plain wrong, like, like unjust laws. Slavery and the Mexican-American War. He points to these as big no-nos that show why sometimes you got to stand up to the government. The role of government, Thoreau likes his government on the minimalist side. He thinks the best government is the one that does the least and stays out of people's hair. Individual action and social change. He's all about taking action on your own. Don't just wait around for politics to change things. Get out there and do something yourself. Tax resistance. Thoreau talks about that time he didn't pay his taxes because he didn't want to support slavery or the war, which landed him in jail for a bit. This was his personal way of throwing shade at the government. Moral responsibility of individuals. He really hammers home the idea that people need to step up and push back against a government that's doing harm. Spiritual awakening and awareness. Thoreau wants everyone to wake up and smell the injustice, get spiritually in tune, and realize when the government is out of line so they can take a stand. Civil disobedience is not just a historical piece. It's a call to action that tells us sometimes breaking the rules is part of making things right, especially if those rules suck. For anyone digging into UGC Net English, Thoreau's essay is a must-know because it lays out a powerful argument for personal ethics over blind compliance. Transcendentalism was this cool movement that popped up in 19th century New England, all about believing in the natural goodness of folks, feeling a deep connection with everything in creation and trusting intuition over logic to really understand stuff. Uh, this vibe was influenced by a bunch of different philosophies and religions, like German transcendentalism, old school texts from India and China, and some pretty out there mystical ideas. Uh, it was basically about crafting a way of thinking that could totally free up the mind. Kicking off around Concord, Massachusetts, between 1830 and 1855, transcendentalism was this blend of young rebels and seasoned thinkers, all aiming to cook up a distinctly American culture. Big names like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau were at the heart of it, throwing out all sorts of ideas through their writings and some wild living experiments like Brook Farm and Thoreau's famous stint at Walden Pond. These transcendentalists weren't just about navel-gazing. They got stuck into social activism, too. They pushed for women's rights, better conditions for workers, staying sober, switching up diets and fashion, religious freedom, shaking up education, and a bunch of other social changes. Their magazine, The Dial, was where they dropped a lot of their groundbreaking thoughts. The ripple effect of transcendentalism was huge, stretching way past its own era. It left its mark on American literature, philosophy, environmental planning, architecture, and the arts. Even later, bigwigs like William James, John Dewey, and Frank Lloyd Wright tipped their hats to transcendentalist ideas, which really set the stage for a whole lot of American creativity and innovation across various fields. For anyone diving into UGC Net English, getting a grip on transcendentalism is key because it shows how deep this movement went in shaping American thought and culture.